I V M. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IVM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IVM swag. So do fill out those surveys. I grew up in a town where every household had a partition story to tell. And when I would read my books, I didn't really find those stories anywhere. You know, for people who may not be aware, partition is regarded as the largest migration in modern human history. 15 million people within a span of less than six months, really three to four months, moving across borders. We had 8 million people come into India and 4 million move out. While the estimates vary, it's anywhere from 2 to 5 million dead. That is a catastrophe. And the fact is that we have pushed it to the margins of our sort of collective consciousness and collective history. Hello and welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast. The partition of India is the largest migration of people in the recorded history of the world. Almost 15 million people migrated cumulatively across the so-called border in a very short time frame. Close to 2 million people died because of the resulting violence. Yet, when it comes to literature or cinema for that matter, the partition is not a subject that Indian creators have dwelled on a lot over the years. In roughly 75 years since the event, there have only been a handful of books or films on the subject. Contrast that to how the West regards the Holocaust, for example, and the number of great artistic works that it has inspired over the years. My guest Mandreed Sodhi Someshwar is the author of the book Lahore, the first in her partition trilogy, which was published by HarperCollins recently. This is a subject that she is extremely passionate about, and the trilogy is the result of almost two decades of her research. Manreet grew up in a border town in Punjab listening to the stories on the partition. I want to speak to her about what the event means to her, why there aren't too many stories around it, and why she feels a woman's perspective is critical on the subject. Especially since she often says that it was a war where the woman's body was the battlefield. I also want to talk to her about how an engineer and an IM Calcutta grad who worked in Unilever and then at Booz Allen, became an author of historical thrillers. Stay with us. We'll be right back on the Filter Coffee Podcast. Intel vPro provides the complete manageability tools to detect, repair, and protect your devices remotely so your workforce can keep doing what they do best wherever they're working from. Today, as most employees and IT teams no longer work under the same roof, fixing glitchy PCs and proactively managing the PC fleet has become increasingly difficult. The Intel vPro platform addresses these problems. With its Intel Active Management Technology, or Intel AMT, vPro enables IT to keep mission-critical resources running by establishing a secure connection between IT and an Intel vPro platform-based PC. In the event of a cyber attack, Intel AMT lets IT remotely manage and repair systems simultaneously, even if they are dispersed across multiple locations. PCs can be recovered quickly, wherever they may be. Plus, the Intel Endpoint Management Assistant, or the Intel EMA, enables cloud-based manageability using simple web-based tools to connect with and remediate any Intel vPro platform-based PC. Both these tools provide better manageability and faster response times, resulting in substantial device management, support cost savings, and fewer helpless tickets. Visit www.intel.in slash itheroes to know more. Intel vPro, built for business. Welcome to the Filter Coffee Podcast, Manreet. Where are you talking to us from? Uh, thank you for having me, Karthik. I am speaking from New York City. 
and uh, how has the last year year and a half been for you were you in new york throughout the lockdown yes we've been in new york throughout and i think we were uh, sort of largely infamous in the world for being the city which became the pandemic capital for a while uh, though i have to say that uh you know under the leadership of now uh, the infamous go- governor cuomo we did manage to sort of get on top of it and i would say by summer last year you know new yorkers had access to the parks and we were going to the grocery stores and and generally i think the mask mandate was being observed so uh overall the city i think did pull through and we did well so that's been our life um, you know my daughter was to start college but she started it from home via zoom uh and my husband was at home as well uh you know and we live in a typical manhattan apartment which is like a mumbai apartment you know you only have so much space and as we joke oh, it's it's a marvel that we didn't kill one another we survived and the best part is the cat we have a cat in the house who's my daughter's cat really um and i claim to use her as my support animal uh, because you know writers are solitary artists and they need all the support they can get <laughs> but the cat initially was very baffled because she couldn't fathom why there were three people in the house when normally everybody left at 7 a.m. but she parked herself therefore in the living room from where she could keep an eye on each one of us <laughs> so yeah you know the pandemic has now sort of become part of life though i have to say in new york city it pretty much is back to uh, normal uh, except for everybody wears masks and you know they check your vaccination cards for indoor events but yeah that's that's life now i think going forward wonderful and we are recording this in um, in sometime in october i no longer remember dates and and and, and time anymore <laughs> uh and uh, i think what you said about uh, the, the capital of the pandemic i think that's more like a rolling shield like different cities over the last year and a half had had the pleasure of being that and uh, i live in in delhi though i'm i'm talking to you now from chennai um i think delhi was uh, yeah. was 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 that city probably in in may june i guess mm-hmm. um so glad to know that your cat took care of all of you and saw <laughs> saw it through the pandemic what is her name if i may ask her name is nix which is n y x and most people assume that it is new york nix which is a uh, one of the sport companies but it is not yes. she's a black cat i hope she will show up at some point uh, she roosts on my table all the time uh but nix is the greek goddess of the night uh, that is my mm. daughter and her fascination for greek myths so yeah that she's a black cat and green eyed oh, goddess <laughs> that's beautiful that's beautiful <laughs> uh what did i want to i want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your younger years um and uh, where did you grow up and uh, what worlds did you inhabit early on I grew up in a border town uh, which is smack on the border between India and Pakistan um, unlike its more famous uh, town sister town Amritsar uh, this town is Firozpur and it actually for history buffs Firozpur is fairly relevant because it is one of those towns which was muslim majority i think 60% uh, at the time of india's partition and it by the laws of partition it should have gone to pakistan but it stayed within india because if you look at radcliffe's line there is a squiggle around firozpur which enables firozpur to stay within india there's a lot of speculation as to why that happened uh, suffice to say that firozpur was a large military cantonment it still is a large cantonment area which means you know there is a fair amount of ammunition and military arsenal which was present in the city So this is also a riverine town because the river Satluj flows on its uh, right bank and across the river is the town of Kasur and beyond that is Lahore. So um it was very common that there was an intrinsic sort of economy between Lahore and Firozpur and if you bring in Amritsar it was kind of an isosceles triangle and in pre-partition Punjab Amritsar was a financial capital the commercial capital of punjab lahore was a cultural capital firozpur was just in the shadows but it is a town which had history behind it and i grew up in this town listening to stories about partition from just about every household my father hails from uh, a family of agricultural uh, sort of uh, land holders you know what they call gentleman farmers uh, in punjab which means you own a lot of land and you have tenant farmers who work on it. and most of the tenant farmers uh, in my father's family used to be muslim 
And I heard stories about how people had to sort of evacuate, leave right away. Literally in the night, you were told you had to go. And, um, you know, when you're a child growing up in that environment where the air itself is suffused with the stories, you pay no attention to it because it is like part of the furniture. And then in my adolescence uh, is when what they call the lost decade of Punjab, which is really a 15 year period when the Sikh militancy was uh, sort of came to the surface and grew to the sort of position that it did. And during that time, Firozpur came to be called a militant hotbed. And it was an area, the borders were porous and allegedly terrorists, which is Sikh militants were fleeing across to Pakistan, which had these camps to foster them and help them. My father was a criminal lawyer. So I, we saw it very closely uh, because he would be summoned uh, in the middle of the night uh, there would, a bell would ring, he would go out, and then he had to go with some farmer, some person who had come from the village because the police had come and plucked his son in the middle of the night. And the thing is, at that time, we were under what is called the TADA. I think it is now sort of goes by the UAPA, which is basically TADA was Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Act. Yeah. And the, the sort of horrendous thing about it was that police could pick up just about anybody, take them to jail, and have Unless within 24 hours, you file a particular writ, which is called the habeas corpus, which literally, which is Latin for show me the body. Unless you did it within 24 hours, uh, parents had no idea where their boys were. And uh, so that's why my father came into play because he was a criminal lawyer and the villagers would just rush to get him uh, in time to file that habeas corpus. And now it is very, uh, it is a certified fact that a lot of these men were taken to the border areas, told to run in the direction of Pakistan and shot in the back. And thus the police had terrorist encounter. One more terrorist notched on their list. So I grew up during this time. This was my teenage years, my adolescence, when again, uh, all our town was saying was the general consensus was that it's 47 all over again. Uh, this time it was between Hindus and Sikhs. Uh, earlier it had been between Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs on the other side. But once again, you know, I had my board exams. Um, I sort of just put my head down, studied uh, like any sort of good average, averagely good Indian uh, student in a household which is obsessed with academics. And then I moved on. I went to my engineering college in Chandigarh. I went to, to my uh, management I in Calcutta. I moved to my first job in Bombay and had a corporate career for like almost a decade after which we moved to Singapore. Uh, on my husband's job and this was in uh, just at the turn of the millennium and my work had been fairly hectic because I had joined uh, Hindustan Labour as a uh, sales manager in fact I was the first woman in sales in the detergent business you know what we call the sabun oh, wow. tail not the Lipton not the chai business because they had had women in, in Lipton and Brookbond I had done that and I was the area sales manager for Gujarat and Bombay Metro so four days I was on the road uh, I would come home for the weekends um, and then I was with a consulting firm called Booz Allen and Hamilton, which again was a lot of travel involved. And then I moved to Lintas, which wasn't so much travel, but within a year and a half, we moved to Singapore. So to cut a long story short, I thought I would just take a sabbatical, you know, just sort of uh, put my feet up. And in Singapore, they have this wonderful term called Thai Thai, which is really a woman of leisure. And I thought I would like to try that, you know, see what it is like. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we uh, moved into a semi-furnished apartment. Uh, the house was all set. I didn't have anything to do. And my husband would leave pretty early in the morning. Uh, and I just sat down because, you know, when you're used to working all your sort of waking hours and suddenly you have this span of time, you really don't know what to do with yourself. And I had this idea of a short story, which had sort of been bubbling in my mind. And I said, mm. you know, let me, let me just write it. Let's see what happens. And that's when I started writing and, you know, I was so engrossed in it that before I would realize it would be dusk and time for my husband to come back. And I also realized that I was really enjoying it. It was something I hadn't ever done because all my writing had been, as a corporate warrior, had been PDFs and, you know, presentations. But again, you know, I wrote one short story I wrote another, I showed it to my husband and a couple of friends and they said, well, it's not bad. And clearly I was encouraged enough. I thought, okay, let me write. 
And, um, you know, uh, the, the good thing with an MBA training is that it gives you an idea, a sense of purpose. You cannot do anything without having a goal. And I said, OK, I'm going to write six short stories in the six months of sabbatical and uh, you know, then I'll be done with it. And I kind of got four or five done. But the end result was that I was enjoying myself so much. And I was also had started tussling with a lot of the demons uh, of my growing up years, which I had sort of packed in the trunk, but that had opened up, you know, and they were staring me in the face. And a lot of my stories had started uh, featuring them. So I extended the six months to 12 months, extended my sabbatical. I said, OK, let's see what we can do with that. But again, to cut a long story short, I wrote a short story which wouldn't suffice uh, at being a short story. And it dealt with the time of the militancy. And when I wanted to write more, I realized I didn't understand most of it because I'd never really paid attention to what was happening around me. I didn't understand, for instance, why the Sikh militancy had happened. So I, instead of, you know, the, the salons of the Thai Thais, I started going to the Singapore National Library. Uh, and Singapore has an excellent library network. It was, I could walk to that place. And I just started spending my, all my days there. Uh, just trying to understand. And that took me back to 47, which took me back uh, further to you know, the early uh, 20th century and back. And I realized that there was an arc, which if I trace could bring me to uh, 1984 and maybe even further along. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, I'm one of those people, if I do something, I go all in. So I announced to my husband one fine day that I'm not going back to corporate work. I have a novel to write, and this will be the novel which explores the tumultuous 20th century history of Punjab. Uh, the good thing is that I met my husband <laughs> during uh, my MBA days, so he has he knows me well and he was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> he knew not to argue with me, but that was 2001, and I haven't looked back. Uh, the novel that I started working on took me a good nine years before it got published. It came out in 2009. It's called The Long Walk Home. It's my second published novel, but it's my first novel, and it uh, ex really explores the, uh, the 20th century history of Punjab through a family. Uh, and when it came out, it was received well. Uh, so, you know, it sort of encouraged me to continue on the journey. And that's where I am now, 20 years down the line. This is my 21st year of writing with my seventh book out. Fascinating. <laughs> I just love the story and the arc. Uh, but I wanted to ask you one thing is um, uh, clearly the six months of article is still going on and this obviously taken a, <laughs> <laughs> taken a very different shape and size. And uh, we are all grateful for that because that has given us certain wonderful books. Um, you know, your, your first book, of course, I mean, now I can tell that probably uh, the research for Lahore began in those walks to the Singapore library. Yeah. Uh, Lahore being, you know, the book that you just published. But your, your first book, of course, was Earning the Laundry Stripe, which I'm assuming I haven't had the pleasure of reading that book. But uh, whatever I've, I've read about the book, it's, it's a different genre, isn't it? It's more about your probably reflections from your work life. How did that creep into this path? Yeah, that's a good question. Because, you know, I was, uh, as I said, I had no experience in writing. And at that time, at least, Singapore had no writing schools, you know, unlike the mm -hmm. U.S., which has these MFA programs. And, you know, you can take them with uh, a touch of salt, but they do provide a community. They do provide a certain structure, especially to somebody who aspires to be a writer but doesn't know how to go about it. So I taught myself to write. Uh, I, you know, would basically started reading deeper, whatever text. I've always been a pretty good reader. And I went back to the text, new text, old text. You know, I grew up on a diet of Dickens and Shakespeare, like any uh, Indian who goes to, you know, sort of those convent schools with the ICSC education. So I started reading deeper. And of course, I was reading a lot of history as well to sort of research and understand the period. And history is one thing, but then to craft history into a story, into a narrative, you know, which has, which keeps people engaged is a completely different art. And I had to teach myself all this. And the journey was so long. I did so many drafts. I edited, re-edited. I threw away stuff. It was all getting to a point where I think I was losing my motivation. And my husband said, why don't you write something which is easier? 
which you know will come to you more organically. And he said, why don't you write about your uh, lever days? Because I would talk about that to all my friends. You know, I had so many anecdotes to share because one, I was a woman in sales. I was in an area where a lot of people that I work with, which is really these wholesalers and distributors in upcountry Gujarat, even in Bombay Metro, you go to Bindi Bazaar. I remember going to Bindi Bazaar is a large wholesale market in Bombay. And the first time I went there, I spoke to one of the largest wholesalers and he told me in the midst of it, Madam Pele Indira Gandhi I thi, wo bhi apne baar pehle akele kiye thi, aap bhi kar loge. You know, the, the whole interaction, uh, sort of all my colleagues, my workmates were men. There was no woman in the picture. And there was me. And I had many interesting uh, experiences, largely positive. People were very encouraging. I think my wholesalers in our country, Gujarat, they looked at me as somebody who had to be tutored in this sort of nefarious art of sales. So I had some great experiences and I would narrate them to my friends. And my husband said, why don't you try and craft uh, a narrative out of that? And I thought, oh, wow, that sounds good. And I really needed a break from the long walk home, which was in the sixth or seventh uh, draft at the time. And that's what I did. I started writing and obviously I used my experiences, I leveraged that to create this narrative, uh, which is not to say that the book is exactly a reflection of my years because the book has far more drama and melodrama and adventure. But that took me a year and I sent it out and it was quickly picked up because Long Walk Home was sort of that literary fiction, you're attempting something serious and unless you have a name, uh, publishers are hesitant to pick you up. But with Earning the Laundry Stripes, it was just an all out fun and within six months of release, I actually got a call from Bollywood uh, and, and the book was signed on. It got crafted into a script and then things happened as they do with Bollywood. So it hasn't seen the light of the day. But it also taught me a lesson. And that's something I have done through my writing journey uh, because I do research a lot and I lose myself in that labyrinth of research. And I like it. It obviously does something for me. Um, I really enjoy it. But I think I try and balance when I've written one of those books, I write uh, something which is in a more sort of commercial genre, for lack of another word, because I don't really believe in genres. And I try and do that because it gives me a break from this kind of writing. And which is why I have alternated. I've written thrillers and I write uh, historical fiction. And I feel that's a journey which helps me. It also gives me a chance to explore these other facets of my own, you know, sort of experience. I have a teenage daughter, you know, the things that I see through them, learn with her. So I plow those into um, other books. So for instance, my last book, six books were Girls in the City, which is an exploration of sorority, you know, three young working women in Bangalore. And it came out of the Me Too movement. You know, how do women face this on a daily basis and still live their lives with joy and fun? So yeah, right. that, that's the <laughs> trajectory of that. It's beautiful. One thing I noticed and I think uh, this is probably a streak in um, many or most of your books, is that the depth of the research is, of course, very evident. But uh, the story is through fiction, right? Somewhere in the first 50 pages, I was asking myself that, uh, why did she choose fiction as the narrative? Mm -hmm. It could have very easily been a non-fiction book. In fact, uh, when you open the book, uh, it says the li list of characters, but it, what it actually lists down is the protagonists of the politics of the time, right? Uh, both in India as yeah. well as in the East India Company and in Britain. The story behind why you write about what you write is very evident as I listen to you. But uh, was the genre always going to be fiction in your head when you started this journey? Yeah, you know, Karthi, that's an excellent question because it's something I have tussled with myself a lot. As I said, I am a history buff and I write historical fiction. So, you know, why not write pure history? you know, historical mm -hmm. narrative. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that, as I said, I grew up in a town where every household had a partition story to tell. And when I would read my books, whether they were history textbooks or history books or fiction, uh, I didn't really find those stories anywhere. And while, you know, we've had some great fictional narratives set around partition, whether it's uh, Krishna Sobhdi, Kushwan Singh, you know, even Gulzar Sab through his uh, film Marches or through his poetry or Amrita Pritam and, and so many, Yashpal, so many. 
I still feel that we fall woefully short of what a cataclysm like that actually deserves. And I, I live in New York City, which is sort of a, the heart of uh, American publishing and also a very large Jewish diaspora is settled here. And every year, the literature which is churned out, which concerns the Holocaust, it's formidable. And it's yeah. literature, it's a lot of fictional retelling, uh, narrative nonfiction, and people are tussling with it on an ongoing basis. And I find that missing in our cultural consciousness. I do feel that partition, which is by all accounts horrific, and I do not want to compare it with another uh, cataclysm like the Holocaust, but you know, for people who may not be aware, partition is regarded as the largest migration in modern human history. 15 million people within a span of less than six months, really three to four months moving across borders. We had 8 million people come into India and 4 million move out, um, you know, 5 million from Punjab and 3 million from Bengal. And while the estimates vary, it's anywhere from 2 to 5 million dead. That is a catastrophe. And the fact is that we have pushed it to the margins of our sort of collective consciousness and collective history. Yeah. And as I said, I was very conscious of this missing from all the books I read. So my intent with uh, the Partition Trilogy, which as, I, as you, know, you, you yourself said, I started this journey 20 years back and I'm glad I could not attempt to do this because I needed to do this you know, what Gulzar Saab calls the pasya. You have to put in that amount of work and rigor before you can really come up with something which your mind knows you want to do. And it is my hope with the Partition Trilogy that I have reached at that point in time. Because what I'm trying to do really is on the same stage, have the political leaders who were taking the decisions and then also have the common people, the Aam Admi and Orat, who was impacted by that. You know, there is probably uh, Freedom at Midnight by Lapierre and Collins, but beyond that, we haven't had anything, not to my reckoning, I don't, I don't think I have come across anything which takes these leaders and puts them on the same stage with the common people and, and shows us who's taking decisions and how people are being impacted. Right. I also wanted to show that these political leaders were facing tremendous challenges and dilemmas as a charger of time was galloping to 15th August, because I feel we are facing two narratives currently uh, in India. One is, of course, that, you know, partition is sort of kind of being denied in its, in its complete humanity, in the way it entirely happened. It wasn't one party versus another. It wasn't Muslims versus non-Muslims or Hindus and Sikhs versus Muslims. It wasn't. As we say in Punjab, kise de saaf nahi? Nobody's hands are clean. We all have bloodied hands. So I wanted to show that. And the second narrative is that we are pitting one political leader, we're pitting Vallabhai Patel against Waharlal Nehru as if they were sort of enemies. And when you go through the archives, when you read the research, you realize they were two very different people, but combined in one unit and working towards a common goal. So I wanted to... You know, and the facetious way in which people uh, sort of complain, oh, you know, the Congress gave Pakistan away, Nehru gave Pakistan away. I wanted to bring those dilemmas to the fore and show people what was really the situation, what was happening. And I want to add that um, it's a strategy of follow, which is if loosely could be called a form of creative semi-nonfiction. Because what I'm doing is I'm using a, a skeleton or a scaffold, which is based off rigorous research and hard sort of data and facts, which have been verified over and over. And on that, I'm adding the flesh, the flesh of the political leaders, the flesh of the common people. And I'm also trying to, you know, in the interstices of history, women are the ones who suffer the most. Yeah. Certainly in the time of partition, it was women's bodies which became the battlefield. And yet those narratives have been lost. So my intent with the trilogy to bring those narratives forward, and which is why I needed to do it via fiction. I also feel that with fiction, with stories are the ones which we respond to. They are our oldest form of being 
entertained, being consoled, you know, whether it's time of happiness or loss or sorrow. And I wanted those stories to be able to talk to people. And that's why I used a historical fiction for this. Yeah. I most certainly resonate with fiction being, you know, the probably the most effective vehicle to tell that story because uh, as you were talking about uh, the publishing history, I was um, I was thinking about the cinematic and the television history in India. And of course, you know, probably my first visual uh, representation of it uh, happened through the film Gandhi, where, you know, probably about a, a minute, couple of minutes is about the partition. And uh, then probably the, the most stark representation of it, uh, for me at least, in my time happened uh, with Gohan Nilani's Tamas. And yeah. I thought it was one of the best original series we've ever produced, right? And that was powerful. That really shook me, even though I was I was, I was barely in school yeah. at that point. But since then, you know, if I look at it, of course, Gulzar Saab has, has a lot of his works. You spoke about him many times. Uh, have sort of talk about uh, those days, and then a handful of other creators. But in cinematic history, we never really explored it, even fractionally as much as Hollywood has done with, with the Holocaust mm -hmm. or or the war itself, uh, with the Second World War. Um, yeah, there are a lot of obvious reasons, of course, as to why. But what, what do you think is, is the reason that we, that we never really went back to it? Is it was it too painful? Uh, you know, this is a question I myself wrestled with for the longest time uh, during my writing and during the research. So I'm a Sikh. You know, I come from a family of Sikhs. And Punjab, unlike Bengal, the situation was Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh. So there was a third element in, in this equation. Uh, also in Punjab, unlike, uh, you know, let's say the United Provinces at the time, in Punjab, people in villages and cities uh, of different religions lived cheek by jowl. There was no ghettoization. There was no, oh, this, there was some, like you could say, this mohalla is largely Muslim, but that would be more defined by the trade, the occupation they were in. So it was very common. It was, in fact, the norm, whether you were in the city of Lahore or you went to, uh, you know, the, the, the villages, for people to be living, literally, to have a neighbor who's a Muslim uh, on your left side, a Hindu on your right side. So that was Punjab at the time. And when the British demand for uh, sort of the divide in play, pitting one against the other in the electoral sort of uh, rules as well, started, Punjab is the one which was sort of most seriously hit because most people forget the demand for partition, the demand for a Muslim homeland rose out of UP. It never rose out of Punjab. In Punjab, there was never a sense that this person is my enemy. There was at worst a kind of tolerance of the other person's rituals, at best a participation, a communal mingling. And especially at the level of women, you know, it was the norm was for women once, you know, the men had gone to work, let's say, let's take a village and they had gone to the fields, the women would finish their morning chores. And then they would all sit down and sort of either work on an embroidery, uh, you know, for an upcoming marriage, you're doing a bag, which is sort of this elaborate embroidery, uh, which is done. And it's called bag, which literally means garden, because you don't want any part of the fabric to show through. So it is that densely embroidered. And it's like when you do carpet weaving, when you see in Persia or, or Turkey, there are two, three people working on it simultaneously. So women, for instance, were engaged. They were raising, you know, it's how women do things. They tell each other stories. They're raising each other's children. This And they're playing with them. They're feeding them. So when the, this idea of partition hit, it really was like a thunderbolt for them. And uh, Ashish Nandi, you know, who's our sort of preeminent sociologist, who's done some fantastic work on partition, I think his explanation to me makes a lot of sense. And he said that partition in Punjab is like an exorcism. An exorcism happens when you have something within you, but you have to cast it out. It is no more yours. And... Uh, that was a situation in Punjab when suddenly Punjabis were told that you're not Punjabi anymore. You're a Punjabi Muslim. You're a Punjabi Hindu. You're a Punjabi Sikh. So there's a part of myself which is no more mine. And the kind of violence that erupted therefore, 
you know, it is in many ways you can draw corollaries with Mahabharata as well, which is really brother pitted against brother, which is what this was. And therefore, the kind of horrific violence which has happened was literally cleave my own body and cast this brother of mine out. And it, as you read Lahore, there are a lot of references I make to this. You know, there is sort of a subliminal to the Mahabharata, which is also because the situation in Punjab gets aggravated because we had Muslims and Sikhs who were in the British lexicon, the militant race. So, you know, these were men who had gone to fight in World War I and World War II. And they were back in Punjab in 1945, 46. They were demobilized, but they still had their weapons on them. So it, Combine the situation of exorcism, where you have uh, all these modern grade weapons on men, men who've been taught that they are the militant, they are the macho, they are, you know. And that's why the Hindus, for instance, in Punjab always looked upon the Sikhs as they were their brothers who would sort of, you know, do the, the, the killing. And to a large extent, they did. Hmm. So, and the third complication that I feel is that, unlike the Holocaust, where we have very clear villains and non villains, the Nazis are the villains. We know that. It's a very clear story of black and white. But in Punjab, we do not have that clarity. As I said, and we say in Punjab, Har kise de hat gandin, kise de hat saaf Everybody's hands are bloody because brother turned upon brother. And all the battles were played on women's bodies. So it's truly like, um, if you remember um, the film which came out, I'm trying to remember, uh, based on Bapsi Sidwa's novel, which had Amir Khan, uh, Cracking India. It's called Cracking India here in the US. And it has Amir uh, Khan water? playing. Sorry? Was it water? No, not water. The first Earth, I uh, think she called it. Earth, sorry. My Earth, bad. Yeah, right? yeah, Earth, Earth, so there yes, it's yeah, based yeah. off, yeah, the novel is based off the perspective of a young Parsi girl. And she sees that her, the domestic help in, in the house of the young Hindu woman is snatched away by the Muslim man who, who sort of works, does odd jobs in their house. So it was that kind of frenzy. And I think there was too much guilt. There was too much shame. And the only way we could move forward was to bury it and say, that's done. Uh, and that's why we've not had a reckoning with partition. We've not had a reckoning with the past. And that's why we've not been able to heal. And that's why every single moment we have, we are like, oh, Pakistan did this. Pakistan, the Muslims have been the other for so long. They have just become a stand-in now, a shoe in for all the traumas that we can hurl at that. Whereas the trauma really lies within. We as a people have to seriously acknowledge the roles that our grandparents you know, our grandfathers had in it and say that we have to heal. The person on the other side is our family. It is our brothers and sisters. And there is no other way to look at that. Right. Yeah, the film being 1947 Earth, and that's another film that I really absolutely enjoyed. Uh, I mean, enjoyed in the sense, uh, loved uh, cinema, which I forgot, you know, when we were talking about uh, cinemas around partition. You know, as you're talking, one thing that uh, that comes to my mind is actually two things. One, I think very clearly uh, a theory that I had not till now really considered much was uh, maybe the uh, the tremors of it are still there. And uh, uh, maybe we are really close uh, to the place and the incidents and it sort of probably hasn't ended and it continues. Um, and the way we probably react to Pakistan in today's date is probably a symptom of that. I don't know. But the thing I want to ask you is, um, you know, yours is obviously decades of research on the subject. And you started the conversation by saying that, um, you know, you grew up in a Punjab where the stories are in the air, right? Uh, they're all over Punjab. Um, but even for someone like you who grew up there, you know, uh, probably amidst conflict with your father being a lawyer, uh, I'm assuming your research would have opened newer windows to what happened in, in 47, right? Uh, what are some of the learnings that uh, probably surprised you, right? Uh, your own understanding of what happened and uh, what came through the research. Are there any things that made you shift your own uh, baselines? Yeah, so I see this is a two-part question or two parts that I want to answer. One, you said the fact that partition is still sort of resonant with the present times. And absolutely, yes. 
So for instance, you know, and I've done some work on this, I've done oral history research around 1984, uh, especially the survivors of 1984 in Delhi, and they're called Chaurasi. Chaurasi yeah. is, you know, Hazar Chaurasi Gima is the famous novel, Chaurasi is 84. So they're called Chaurasi. You know, that's the sort of moniker by which they go. And uh, most people are unaware, but there is actually a colony in East Delhi called the Chaurasi colony, yeah. which is full of women, and children who have, of course, grown up now, but these are the widows of the men who were brutally hacked in open daylight over a three to four day pogrom in the capital of India. And these children who have now grown up, are adults, grew up with stories and with the loss of their fathers, grandfathers, uncles, other men in their lives. And when we speak to the people, and this has been well documented, it was almost like what happened in 47 was copy pasted in 84. Uh, for instance, the, the, the way men, Sikh households were identified, mm. the way the men were killed, the way the women were brutalized. All of these, the very specific acts have a complete replay from 47, which is part of a cultural memory. It is what the body remembers. We haven't put it away. We haven't cast it away. Right. And I feel that we just have to pay attention to all the so-called communal rights that we talk about in India. And we find a replay every single time. It's a spiral of violence that we just haven't tackled. And we will not unless we openly, frankly, and with some deal of empathy and honesty, talk about partition. And coming to your second question, which was sort of researching this period and, mm. and figuring uh, it out. I think for me, my biggest understandings, as I said, have been the, about the complicity of everybody involved and therefore the guilt and the reluctance to ventilate our thoughts and experiences and what happened. And two is sort of the abiding patriarchy of our system, of our culture. And I grew up in Punjab, which is sort of, you know, the birthplace, you could say, of patriarchy. But I was fortunate because I grew up in a household where I was raised by feminists, both my mother and my father. They, we are five siblings, four sisters, uh, one brother. And my parents raised me and my other sisters that, you know, you have to grow up and work. We were not raised, you have to grow up and get married. And the only reason I bring it forth is that the thread of patriarchy, the abiding thread of patriarchy, we see in all the decisions that have happened, that happened during partition and afterwards. For instance, the very idea of one inflicting violence on the woman, because, you know, um, as Kamala Basin, who recently passed away, the fiery feminist said, who asked yeah. you to place your honor in my vagina? But that's what it does. You know, why does a clan's owner reside in a woman's vagina? So that was done. And then the rehabilitation of women. Because, and that was a double-edged sword as well. So on one uh, extent, both Liaquat Ali Khan, who was the Pakistan Prime Minister, and Jawaharlal Nehru and Vallabhai Patel, who were Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of India, were very clear that they had to bring the Sitas back home. Sort of, you know, they were the Ram and they would bring the women back home. But a lot of these women, the dilemma was that one, they had got married. You know, maybe they were raped, they were abused, they had got married, they had children. And to pluck that woman from her home and bring her back, this is a dilemma that Amrita Pritam uh, captured wonderfully, so evocatively in a, her novel called Pinjar, which was made into a fabulous film as yeah. well. Which, you know, I would urge everybody to see if they haven't. And on the other hand was the fact that when the women were brought back, while the leaders were bringing them back, many times their own households rejected them because the women had been defiled. Their husbands rejected them, their mothers-in-law rejected them, their parents rejected them. So there was this question of rehabilitating these women then. And we have to give kudos to our leaders because Jawaharlal Nehru particularly paid a lot of attention to the rehabilitation of the refugee, especially the women. And Edwina Mountbatten, who was, uh, you know, first the Vizereen and then after India became independent, was the governor general's wife because Mountbatten stayed on in India as the governor general for nine months. She did tremendous work uh, with the refugees. 
And these are things, again, as I said, we don't talk about. It was only my research because I was very aware that in the narratives that I was reading, you know, you read some great historical narratives set around 1947. None of them really talk about the women. Where are the women in the stories? What happened to them? And those were the things I really had to go in search of because there aren't too many records as well. So for instance, when the refugees were coming in, there was this uh, retired justice of the Delhi High Court, who is one of the few people who actually spoke to the women and wrote down. But in many cases, you know, his team were clerks, were men who were writing this down. And often when women are talking about being abused, they use euphemisms. So they will say, I was used, I was badly used. You know, and when the men are recording it, they're not writing that the woman was raped. So mm. therefore, when you look at the records and you want to factually sort of count data and say this many women were raped, you're not going to find too many numbers. But if you read in between the lines, if you read with empathy for how a woman experiences it and how she speaks, then you find the instances. So these were the things that I was really seeking. And I have to say that we don't have too many narratives which talk about that. And it was my intention to eke them out of those interstices, to bring them forward and to flesh them. So for instance, even in Lahore, the uh, sort of the common people thread that I have, it is very, very strongly uh, derived of narratives of people who suffered a partition, who went through a lot of this. Of course, what I've done is I've combined the narrative. So if there is Tara, who's one of my protagonists, the yeah. things that I talk about, it's not that all those things happen to a woman, but I use things which have actually happened, which women spoke about, and then I gave them to my two female protagonists, which is Tara and Pammi in the novel. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, but really those were the things which, hmm. uh, which I was interested in, why, one, the role of women, where they are, and I was always surprised by how patriarchy had snuffed that, even in the narratives that we had, and how many labyrinthine sort of lanes I had to traverse to get those out. And two was the idea that we are all complicit, and we need hmm. to be aware of that and talk about it. Right. A lot of things to unpack in that. And, and some of them, I'm just going to leave it as it is because um, it's a great exploration in the book. Um, you know, you spoke about uh, rehabilitation, both after partition, as well as after 84. And, uh, you know, I think I was reading Kuldeep Nair's autobiography, and he spoke at length about how, you know, the, the entire establishment or the settlement of Faridabad of today actually started off as a rehabilitation of refugees sort of a setup, right? Uh, right. So some riveting tales in terms of how we reacted as a, as a country. Um, and also, you know, uh, one thing that uh, is also very evident in your narrative style is the woman's perspective coming through in your story. But more than me talking about it, you know, you have called this out as a, as a first part of a trilogy. And, uh, you know, for someone who is picking this up, or in the process of uh, finishing the book, what are they looking forward to in this trilogy? What, what is the takeaway that you intend for them? Right. So uh, my intention of the partition trilogy, as I said, was to broadcast how resonant partition is with the current times. You know, uh, I feel I'm a Faulknerian writer in the sense that I feel my hometown made me a writer. Because as Faulkner said, the past is never dead. The past mm -hmm. isn't even past. And I truly believe that. So with the Partition Trilogy, there are three books. Uh, part one is Lahore, which is set in the nine months leading up to the Partition of India. And books two and three are Hyderabad and Kashmir, which are set in the 15 months thereafter. And here I am looking at these two large princely states, which were the biggest dilemma facing uh, both Nehru and Patel after partition, because yeah. how do you integrate them into uh, the, the Union of India going forward? And for people who may not be aware, India had 565 princely states. And when we make the assumption, uh, when we ask the question at independence, why did India give Pakistan away? It is a facetious assumption. It is absolutely false because the plans that were being drawn up actually had the British departing India and leaving 
a variety of options where there could have been an, a Muslim majority Pakistan and India, but not the India that we take for granted, but a princesstan, which is 565 princely states who could yeah. combine to form a union, who could form multiple unions, but were each independent and the rest of that would be an India. And it would be, as I have Patel uh, say in Lahore, like, uh, you know, it would be um, a curry with mutton pieces strewn all over because there would be no cohesive India. So that's an assumption we make. The fact is that these two leaders worked very hard into to so that by the time 15th August arrived, we actually had a landmass that we could call India. Yeah. However, when 15th August happened, we still had these two large princely states which were in sense uh, the mirror opposite of each other. Hyderabad was Hindu majority with a Nizam, a Muslim Nizam, and Kashmir was a Muslim majority with a Hindu Maharaja uh, at the helm. And time t equal to now, Hyderabad is, uh, is very much a part of India and there aren't any questions asked, but the uh, territorial integrity of Kashmir is still at question and has been the source of the ongoing uh, war with Pakistan over almost 75 years. And I'm very keen to showcase how, what were the actions which were taken by the leaders in these two diametrically different stories and how we end up where we are now. So, you know, Hyderabad is book two and I chose it uh, deliberately as book two because in terms of narrative, you can complete the arc because India actually, uh, they call it, police operation, but it was a military invasion. We went into uh, Hyderabad, we invaded it, and we made it part of our union. In Kashmir, the story is completely different because it is still fluid, it is moving, and that's book three. Uh, and again, the narrative has two parallel threads. There will be the political thread, which has uh, three main protagonists, uh, Nikki Mountbatten, Dwarla Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, and the local thread, which has the arm um, army in order there, and I do pay specific attention to my female protagonists in, in this, these threads. Right, and that, that's obvious in your narrative. Marit, we usually end the show by asking you know, our guests uh, what he or she is watching, reading, or listening to. <laughs> you know, while I'm really, really tempted to ask you, you know, how do you sort of give yourself the relief between books and uh, between something that is uh, so deep and probably so troubling? I want to ask you slightly, this question in a slightly different way. Um, I think writing about conflict is, uh, is never easy. And uh, especially for someone who comes from the same region, uh, they become, I'm assuming, more personal uh, than for someone who's just looking at it as a, from a journalistic lens. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, when it comes to either films or literature or audio content on conflict, what are some of the things that have inspired you in these in these 20 years? What are some of the things that you feel like uh, something you want to aspire to yourself? Let me answer it on two levels. One is when I write about, you know, partition and a lot of time, my friends who have known me for a very long time from engineering, they say, Yaar, phir wohi kahani. you know how friends are. There. I'm like, no, no, read it. It's different. It's a different kahani. But the fact is that um, I, I do feel that there is, that we should be hopeful. And the example I always give is, you know, the era, which is the, uh, the Irish problems, what they call the problems, right? Uh, for the longest time, they also use the euphemism troubles. Ireland had troubles with, with yeah. England. And that problem was resolved. Then it was resolved by sitting down by leaders on both sides saying, we have to reach the bottom of it. And they reach the bottom of it by talking to people, by having people air the deepest grievances and listening. So a kind of truth and reconciliation, which we have never done. South Africa is another brilliant example where, you know, after decades of apartheid, when finally, you know, South Africa became free, they held a truth and reconciliation commission. Yeah. And the whole purpose of that was that unless we ventilate, unless we bring it in the open, unless we air it, we will not be able to heal. And I, so I feel there is a reason. There is a reason to be hopeful and which is the reason why I write these books. Because one, I want to bring it up to our general consciousness so that we become aware. You know, we don't see the other as the other. There is no other, you know. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is um, from the Upanishad, which says, Tattvam Asi, which is basically, there is no other. That's sort of the literal translation. There is no other. 
So when we say the other, the other is a part of us because finally, you know, you're all part of one humanity. Uh, in terms of being inspired myself, I, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of historical fiction, which I don't need to say. <laughs> and, and I love reading historical fiction. I have been greatly inspired by Hilary Mantle because of what she had done with her uh, Cromwell trilogy. And I have to say that when I was searching for a way to uh, write my own partition trilogy, I very deeply read her novels. Of course, her novels are written very differently and I write my very differently. She has Cromwell as the person. Mine is more polyphonic. There is an orchestra. There are multiple protagonists and they're all speaking. I'm giving each one of them a stage. I also use, um, there is an American academic uh, called Sadia Hartman. And I would urge people to look her up because her work is fabulous. And she has done a lot of uh, work with African-Americans and African-American history and bringing it into the mainstream narrative. And she uses uh, some of the strategies which I myself use, which is basically use a sort of a skeleton of nonfiction. And then on that of top of it, you build a flesh of uh, narrative fiction. I love watching good cinema, hmm. uh, but I uh, am also a bit picky in the sense that if I watch it, the first five minutes don't work for me, I let it go. I, I'm very <laughs> decisive <laughs> and harsh that way. So my husband gets bothered very often. He's like, we just sat down to watch it, give it 15 minutes. And I'm like, no, nah, mm -hmm. this is done for me. So I, I do watch a lot of cinema. I'm a huge Spielberg fan, which, you know, again, if you follow historical uh, yeah. dramas and how he does that, Steven Soderbergh, um, uh, Ridley Scott, I enjoy all kinds of uh, entertainment. I also indulge in a lot of Tintin reading over and over because my daughter and I both love it. Uh, in fact, she was here for a three-day weekend and we re-watched uh, Tintin by Spielberg. Um, of course. Yeah, yeah. So we watched that. And then, you know, we live close to a park. So I try and go out and do walks uh, and an occasional jog. But being with nature, I find very uh, comforting. I grew up in a small town, so, you know, I had a lot of, uh, behind my home, basically there were fields which opened out and I would take my dog for a walk morning and evening. And I feel, uh, my daughter says I'm a peasant at heart. I am. I'm a farmer's daughter. And <laughs> even when I live in a big city, I seek out places which are, you know, sort of green and quiet. And, uh, and I'm fortunate that I have access to that. So, yeah, those are the things that inspire me. Also, my family keeps me rooted. I absolutely wouldn't be writing these kind of novels if I didn't have a place to go back at the end of it, which is comforting and loving, which accepts me for the way I am. Because you're right, a lot of times, uh, especially during the pandemic, because my daughter was seeing me every day, I would come out at lunch and we'd have lunch together. And there were days she would ask me, so whom did you kill today? Because, you know, I'm writing novels where people are getting killed and she would look at my face and I, it's, you know, you live through your characters, you are your character when you're writing them and, and when you have to do terrible things to them, you're in a sense doing terrible things yourself to your own self. So it, it is tough, but you know, uh, it is good to surround ourselves with love and you know, family and friends. So yeah. Are you listening to a lot of podcasts these days? I am. What, what, are, you, what are some of your favorites? Uh. <laughs> I, I, so I have been listening, as I told you earlier, I listen to Filter Coffee podcasts. I listen, listen to a few other IBM podcasts as well. I think Grand Kamasha I've done a few times. Um, I listen to Amit Verma, Seen Unseen, which takes a good three, four hours of my time <laughs> out of my life. But more <laughs> often than not, it's, it's a splendid podcast. And I love yes. his range of social, cultural, political uh, themes that he brings to bear. I also listen to a lot of uh, literature and book related podcasts. So the London Review of Books is one of my favorites. I really enjoy that. They also, uh, LRB also has a political and literature stance. So I like the way they always bring politics into literature, which is sort of my own way of looking at things. I listen to the New York Times uh, book review podcast, which is very interesting as well. Right. Uh, and then, you know, we have uh, 
my husband has introduced me to several podcasts which are as he says strictly nothing to do with literature <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we talk about things like cryptocurrency and I nod along you know like okay <laughs> So some somewhere down the line there might be a huge conflict i hope not with the cryptocurrency stats but uh, uh mandri thank you so much for sharing all of the things that you did with us it was absolutely wonderful to listen to you thank you karthik it's been lovely speaking with you and being a part of your show i wish you great success as you go forward in podcast likewise thanks so much If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am the underscore Karthik. That's Karthik with an H on Twitter and filter underscore coffee. That's coffee with a K on Instagram. Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Storytellers and Storytellers, Vinny talks to Mansi Gupta, aka Max Play, about her rapid growth as a female gaming creator on YouTube. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam speaks to Sandeep Bagla, CEO of Trust AMC, about the status of death funds during the pandemic and their importance in portfolios. On a show about crypto, Rohan asks the question, what is a crypto wallet? To Tarusha Mittal, podcaster and COO at Oro Pocket, Uniform and Cloud Reno. On the life manifesto, Zarina dives deep into the imposter syndrome and shares some helpful techniques to overcome it. And on football show, Paul Gaurav and Sivram talk about the showstopper game of the week: Liverpool versus Manchester. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our others for that matter, please do tell a friend. We really appreciate you spreading this. Word of mouth helps a lot. And finally, this week we'd like to thank our sponsors: Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, Point Switch, Kubear, Slay Coffee, and Intel. We really appreciate the support. Have you ever wondered where the business world is headed? How the ways in which we create, market, and sell to consumers will evolve, or if we'll ever go back to wearing pants while working? For answers to all of this and more, tune into Advertising is Dead with me, Varun Dugirala. Every Tuesday, as I talk to entrepreneurs, leaders, and change makers from across business, media, marketing, and beyond, you can catch all episodes of Advertising is Dead on the IBM Podcast website, app, or wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs>